a podcast to honor the gods. This better come with a sacrifice. Dave X Media. This section where this is the last fucking time you will ever hear me talk about Order of the Phoenix. I'm your host, Christina. My co-host today is Brooke. Say hello to the listeners, Brooke. Hi, listeners. It is a pleasure to be here. I've got a scalding hot take, which is that I loved this book on the reread. All right. You just hold on to that feeling. <laughs> just hold on to it. My other co-host today is Haley. Say hello to the listeners, Haley. Hello, listeners. I'm Haley, and I'm stuck here between them. <laughs> um, Haley, I'm so sorry for making you come on both the trauma-dumping final chapter episode of Order of the Phoenix and the group therapy episode. Well, I, I mean, it's, it's a good progression. I went from trauma-dumping, and now we're in therapy. Okay. Yeah, okay. And then we'll move into our denial phase and go on to the yeah, next book. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Serious who? Yeah, exactly. Ain't that the truth? This is our Order of the Phoenix group therapy episode. We're going to just shoot the shit a little bit about our feelings about Order of the Phoenix. We're going to read some listener emails, answer some of your questions, and bullshit a little bit. Probably bullshit a lot of bullshit. it, actually. Probably a lot of it. You know, when I put me, Brooke, and Haley on anything, I'm like, I need this one to be good. (laughs) (laughs) We have a carefully honed dynamic that can only exist between the three particular types of chaos that we all introduce to a conversation. Yeah, sometimes sometimes an Andrew is good, sometimes a Zach, but really it's us. (laughs) Oh, let me read this to you guys. My new favorite patron, tie-dye guy. What the hell did they say? Oh, my God, tie-dye guy, where are you at? Just give me a second. I'm going to cut this. It's going to sound Just so you smooth. fucking wait. Just you fucking can, wait. Can tie-dye guy tie-dye us a tank? I will pay to send him a restricted section tank top if he tie-dyes it and sends it back. Uh, tie-dye guy, let us know if you want to tie us some dyes. But tie-dye guy two days ago said, because he's a a newer patron, he says, I'm listening to the My Immortal episode, and I'm very grateful that I'm the only person here. Otherwise, my coworkers might be concerned for my well-being. I'm pretty sure I'm literally dying. Um, He said, in terms of amount of laughing out loud, that was on par with an episode of Hey Riddle Riddle. Much praise to all involved. Aww. (laughs) And then he he goes on to say, all these bonus episodes are such bangers. Okay, so if you haven't so far, this is your sign from Tie Dye Guy. Sign up for the Patreon. That $5 a month tier gets you these bonus episodes. But Hell of an endorsement. I mean, we're never going to top My Immortal, but like that's... It's my immortal. No one can top it. No one can top it. None of us are particularly top. So the fact that we pulled it off in the first place was a miracle. Truly. (laughs) (laughs) I just want to do a quick shout out to all of our patrons. I'm going to read their names. No, I'm not going to read names because what if some of them are wrong? I've actually I just realized this that it doesn't necessarily say like the name that they want to go by on their Patreon. Um, <laughs> it's got to be like a weird mix of like Nick, like chosen screen names and government names. Yeah. Yes. And sometimes neither one of those is quite right. <laughs> well-oiled machine here at the restricted section. Yeah. Well, shout out to our patrons. I am physically in disbelief every single time shuddering in disbelief that anyone cares enough to listen to us sans paying for it the fact that anyone pays to listen to us is shocking and we love you let's talk about order of the phoenix brooke explain yourself okay so here's the thing um i canonically only read these books once and then never reread them ever again in my life hold them dear but never reread them right so this is my first time ever rereading this series and I'm doing it live on the air with you, our beautiful listeners. Just as a reminder, this isn't live. They're not listening right this second, but... Well, then how are they going to call in, Christina? <laughs> what? If, oh, my God. What if we let, did let them call in somehow? That would actually be fun as hell. That would be fun. I yeah. don't want my what number to be that public, but if we could set up like no, a Google not, Voice number, number or something that what goes if, to the what email. What do you call it? 
what do you call it when you're doing like a telethon and Betty White is taking calls? I, I, that was like one a, of her first TV that, shows. Isn't that a telethon? A te- yeah, it's a telethon. You said it. No, but yeah, you but said you the call, thing. No, no, no. It's like the sw- the switchboards are lighting up or like that's, is that what that that's is? called a call to action, mm-hmm. which I would imagine you would know given the fact that you do. PR and marketing. No, no, no. Switchboards are lighting up is not a call to action. That's a call that action is already happening. Wow. Okay. So I'll bring a vintage technologist on the show and we'll get to the bottom of this. <laughs> um, so anyhow, this is my first time rereading these books to bring us back on track. Uh, Why? Because I'm lawful. <laughs> I'm lawful evil, <laughs> but I'm lawful. <laughs> I was lawful until I got halfway through Order of the Phoenix. Okay, just here's loudly the thing. grinding weed back here. Here is my take on this book that made me love it this time. When I was first reading it, I was a teen. And I thought Harry was quite whiny because I knew exclusively uh, LGBT boys. That <laughs> was like my only friend group for the most part. Um, and then the one hey dude I slept with, because that's how theater companies work. <laughs> So, wow! And you, did you you didn't sleep with any of the gay ones? Because I slept with a couple of the gay ones I by accident. Certainly made out with a few of the gay ones. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, um, because they'll they'll be like, <laughs> I had a lot of gay friends when I was younger. Be like, oh yeah, we'll have sex. I just want to see what it feels like. And then they would be like, no, no, let's just kiss. <laughs> and I'm like, I want everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll take what I can get. No, the, actually, the one that I slept with, I met through theater, but was not in theater. This is way off track. So. Point being that I found Harry quite whiny. I thought that the the drama that existed in this book was nonsense, and I didn't like a lot of it, and I thought that it dragged on for a long time. The things that have wow. changed for this reading. I cannot. Your your literary opinions just mystify me. That you you changed from what you just said that you changed yeah. from that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So here's, what, here's what's changed in my opinions about life. First one is that my reading speed is dramatically increased, which helped this book fly by in a way that it didn't when I was a teenager. Fuck you! I've been reading this since August! I got to do it in chunks. I think it took me, like, three days of distracted reading to finish this book. Yeah. Yeah, if you read it all the way through, you don't... You can go fast enough that you don't notice a lot of my main complaints. Correct. So there's that. And then the second thing that has happened is that I now have the perspective of someone in their early 30s looking at teenagers... And I'm like, this is how teenagers feel to me now as an adult. Just like emotional screaming idiots. Yes. Emotional screaming idiots <laughs> yeah, who I have mean, a desperate it. need to be responsible adults, even though responsible adulthood is kind of overrated. And it's really bad. Like the ways that teens try to take on responsibility is by assuming that they feel things more deeply and therefore are responsible for them. And like, that's not true obviously but i felt like this was a perfect embodiment i i enjoyed it as like a teen melodrama i enjoyed it in the same way that i enjoy wednesday (laughs) you know what i mean like (laughs) that's what it felt like to me on the reread um and it went a lot faster reading it kind of all in one go with an adult reading speed and an adult you know vocabulary comprehension not to brag um but like (laughs) You but know. we do talk like adults. <laughs> um, you know, I language pretty good at this point in my life. And so reading, rereading it, I actually really enjoyed it for those aspects. I found this book to be incredibly comedic on the reread, despite the fact that it is not tonally comedic. Right. I feel like that's a problem. <laughs> With the notable exception of the end, which I think actually is a successful action scene. I find the action to be entertaining to read. At the end, the fight in the ministry. And then I do feel that there's a genuine emotional weight to the death of Sirius Black. So I think between all of those things, I actually really enjoyed this book. Yeah, I kind of agree about like the ending, that the action's fun to read and that there's emotional weight to Sirius Black dying. I don't necessarily agree that like the action sequence like made any sense to me in a lot of ways or that the whole rest of the book was good in any way. (laughs) For me personally, I didn't like it. I think the pacing's bad. I think that the writing's extremely unedited. Like, I just think that so much should have been cut from this, and I don't respect that. There are some standout moments that I love. 
I really, really love the infamous Harry Potter Cho Chang Valentine's Day date. Hmm. I really love the crazy uh, astronomy owl when they go like attack Hagrid and like McGonagall comes out. That's like a fun scene. I like. Oh my god, my brain's just saying you have grop and I can't get away from it now. I like when the twins bust out. So there's like some standout moments, but to me, like everything in the middle is like so inelegantly handled that it's distracting. I do think you're mixing a couple of very interesting character moments, which is first off, anything with Neville in this book. Oh yeah. I think all of the depth that gets added to Neville's character and the fact that we see him in contexts outside of just being a bumbling student, I think is very, very yeah. cool. Um, totally agree. I think that Ginny has a really fun time in this book. I really enjoy her character. And it's the first time we really see her character outside of her being like possessed and scared. Right. Sure. Yeah. And she's 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 pretty cool. And then I do like the like weird tacit dynamics that start to really reveal themselves between Ron and Hermione in this book as well. Oh, mm. yeah. OK. Yeah. Haley, what, what's your take on Order of the Phoenix? So I don't hate this one. Um, I agree with all of your criticisms, Christina. It is too long. The pacing is, like, kind of sloppy. The organization isn't great. There's a lot of stuff in there that doesn't necessarily need to be in there. Those aren't deal breakers for me as a matter of taste because, like, I, I was a nerdy teenager with no friends when this book came out. So, like, for me, like, reading this, I, like, I, I think this might be my most read Harry Potter book because wow. it was the that first... no one besides you Yeah, l- no, I get it. That's fair. Like, it was the first one that had come out in, like, several years, and it was the first one that was coming out when I was, like, about the same age, like, as the characters. I had been significantly younger before this. So, like... I'm angsty and in high school, they're angsty and in high school, and being, like, the poor pacing and the poor organization and, like, the fact that it's just too long means that if you're a sad, lonely teenager with no friends who finds an escape in fantasy books, the longer and more tedious the better because you can spend more time there. So, like, this book kind of builds off of Goblet of Fire with, like, getting to actually explore, like, the outside wizarding world outside of Hogwarts. You go to St. Mungo's, you spend time in the Black House, you, like, you see all of these different places and all of these new, like, oh, here's what adult wizard life might be like. You start getting an idea. And so it was just all the more time and all the more, like, scenery it's it, it's like taking a scenic route on a road trip for me like hmm. yeah is is this a long unbroken stretch of i-95 yeah sure is that's not <laughs> the best but at least it's like a pretty part of it oh my god i do want to clarify that i probably really liked this when it came out because it was like much anticipated because i read it in 24 hours because like so much stuff happens in it. It probably was like at the time, one of the more adult things that I'd read. So I don't remember anything before I was 26, but I feel like I would, I feel like I liked this when it came out. And then I've never, I think really the, what killed it is reading it slowly because I've never read it in under a week. I mean, over a week, like I've never stopped. And been like, wait, look at this every (laughs) fucking inch of the way, because when you stop and look at it every inch of the way, it's that's what ruins it to me. I think the other context piece that I've added to my life since this is that I've slogged myself through every published Game of Thrones book, which in terms (laughs) of unedited, paceless nightmares, this doesn't hold a candle to the nightmare that is George R.R. Martin's writing. So I'm just saying that overall, my patience for... Uh, poor editing jobs has improved dramatically. <laughs> hey man, I read Game of Thrones too. We've we've all been in those trenches. Now that shit, I also to, to be clear though, I was reading that when I was a lifeguard. So I read a Game of Thrones book in like three days, which is fucking insane That's because I was reading lot. I was reading like ten hours a day. 
Um, so maybe I can only read long slog books if I do it in like a single sitting. <laughs> That's a good that thing to know sense. about yourself. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about the Dumbledore issue. I want us to like constantly be checking in with like the read on Dumbledore's character. Um, and I have a couple emails that I'm going to read and then we can chat about him a little bit. Um, this first one's from Claire, our friend Claire. She's been on the show several times before. Hi, Claire. Um, Claire says, hi, Christina and crew. Hope you're doing great. I'm now listening to the Lost Prophecy episode and just want to let you know I hate Dumblehore with a passion, especially in this book. This is a headmaster of a private school. He is putting every Hogwarts student's education and their lives at risk this entire series, especially in Order of the Phoenix. Hope you all enjoy being almost done with this filler book. (laughs) Claire K. Kind of on the flip side, I have an email from Leaf Glore. Not the easiest thing in the world to say. Um, When asked for their pronouns, Leaf Glore said, my pronouns are whatever each person wants them to be. Is is this Leaf Glore of that one review fame? Oh my God, maybe. Wait, is that real? (laughs) Did Leaf Glore write that one legendary review? Is that real? That name sounds very familiar. Certainly that would be not. so funny. Leaf Glor? Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Hang on. Haley's hang on. on it. Okay. That's All so right. You fact funny. check that okay. while Christina okay, okay. Reads, reads it. Okay. No, I want us to be able to. Well, okay. I'm going to read the email and then give us context, Haley. Okay. 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 You asked, so here goes. Dumbledore is a character I enjoy reading because he is realistic. Maybe because the author is a disappointment, so is he. He's realistic. People, uh, real people, wizards would be this way. Yeah, he didn't communicate well to Harry. I don't know a single real life person who communicates well. He keeps his little secrets and didn't tell Harry all the things he should. Neither would a real person. He kept his info to himself and thought he would handle everything because he's Mr. Big Boss Magic Man. He's the big dick on campus. So why would he confide in or info dump on the stupidest griff ever? That's what a real person would do. So, yeah, it's fun to look back and say, Dumby, why you no help Harry? But I believe a real life Fumbledore would do exactly that. People in real life are almost always disappointing and withholding and overconfident. If he would have just told Harry everything and worked with him to defeat Snake Boy, it would probably have worked out well. But it would have been way less realistic, in my opinion. Peace, Leaf Floor. L E F G L O R? Um, this one has an A in it. Oh, L E A F, sorry. L L E A F G L O R? Yeah, that's how you spell Leaf Haley. Is it's, that the person who wrote that yes, four star yes. review about how much they hate us? <laughs> yes. Leaf Glor. He kept I, Leaf Glor. I respect the hell out of you. Eternal. <laughs> <laughs> Leaf Glor. Leaf Glor came directly to my inbox and I did not even recognize. Wow. <laughs> I did not even recognize a friend <laughs> when they approached it's, me. It was it was your it was you sounding it out that I was like this. We've been here before. We've been here before. Haley <laughs> says I do have a memory of this place. Oh my god! Well, first oh off, Leaf Floor, I'm so excited to hear that we didn't turn you off completely and that you <laughs> yeah, continued to hate listen to us. Up oh to my this god. Point. I'm so sorry that I don't know anything about this book series. Did the audio not get better, though? It did get better. Come on. Admit it. <laughs> you can't deny that. Although it's on our next... <laughs> uh, the audio in our episode two weeks from now got a little fucked up. But it's still going to be good. It's going to sound great. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Um, so what... Haley, what's your take on Dumbledore at the end of Order of the Phoenix? Uh, and... Particularly, any responses for Claire and or Leaf Glor? So here's here's my thing. I draw a very strong distinction between liking a character as a person and just enjoying a character. Um, yes. And I, I am an enjoyer of chaotic characters being chaotically aligned myself. So is Dumbledore a good person? Not really, no, no. not really. Um, is he definitely on purpose manipulating a teenager? Is he great at running a school? Uh, yes, and then no. no. Um, so there's that. But I feel also, the same way, I feel the same way about Snape. Like really bad dude, very fun character. Yeah, That's he's how, that so is how I feel. fun. Yeah, that is how I feel about Dumbledore too. Is that I I think that he's a very interesting character, but it alarms me that I used to like glorify his character when I was younger, and that I, I 
20 years ago wasn't critically looking at him and being like, wow, there's a lot to be said about this man and the way that he's interacting with the children in his care. Like, I I think the reason that it's easy to react that way to him is because, like, at least he knows what he's doing. You don't you don't know for sure that it's going to end well for you, but he does very much know everything he's doing, he's doing on purpose. So, like, by God, at least there's that. What do you think, Brooke? Um. Uh, okay. So, I think the reason that there's so much discourse around Dumbledore is that the character that he becomes is not the character he started as. And what I don't mean is that we've learned more about him and that changes things. I mean that I think the author had a completely different character in mind in the early books and then needed mm. him for a different purpose in the later books and adjusted She was raising accordingly. him for sacrifice. I know. <gasps> I mean, it, 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 Cycle I, of abuse. I, I think it goes beyond just like, oh, we learn more about him and we learn that he's complicated. Like, I think that the reason he gets glorified is because he was like a mythic benevolent figure and then... As we needed more plot, <laughs> we changed mm. that direction. Mirror of Erised Dumbledore, totally different person. Mirror of Erised Dumbledore would simply never disappear on a student because they were having a hard time. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, that's just yeah. not what would have happened. So I, I think part of the reason the discourse exists in the first place is because the character is two fundamentally different characters. I think there's a real break around... From between third and fourth book. Mm. So that's, you know, the, to me, that's the reason the dichotomy ex exists. Where do I fall on that dichotomy? I think mm. that uh, I overall like Dumbledore, latter Dumbledore as a character. I don't like him as a person, but I agree with Haley and, and I think you, Christina, to an extent that I think he's interesting to read and mm -hmm. that you know, the complexity to him does feel somewhat realistic for someone who's hundred and Sure. You know, years yeah, old. Yeah. And I, I I think in that amount of time, I think about the number of uh mistakes and shitty things that I've done in thirty one years, and I imagine if I live to be a hundred <laughs> that I would make even more <laughs> shitty mistakes, you know? And I don't think age or wisdom or power, which, you know, most of Dumbledore's uh, authority is based on his power, not necessarily anything else, right? People... Yeah, his power and his seniority. Right. And and his charisma. Neither of those A lot of it, he has, he, has, he has charisma, and, like, that's... Yeah, he's some, suave as hell. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of people have made built entire lives on their charisma alone. Look at Donald Trump. Yeah, I, but I don't think any of those things is Ugh. is intelligence. None of that mm -hmm. is planning. And yeah. none of that is compassion, mm -hmm, you right. know? So I think when you take the reasons that he end up ends up in the position that he's in, uh, I'm not surprised that he makes the choices he does. Yeah, that makes sense. For me, also, it's... Dumbledore is such a trope of a character. Like, he's really not different from Merlin. Like, he's not really that different from Gandalf. He's not even that fucking different from Rick Sanchez. Like, the, there's this archetype of a character, and I just think that I've seen it done better in a lot of other stories, including the three I just named. <laughs> like, I think that Dumbledore is like, how do we make this character nice in a way that, like, Gandalf's not nice like bring him down to like child level but then also he's extremely powerful and he's pulling all the strings and it's like I think the only way to do that is to make him like a manipulator well <laughs> to have both also you gotta remember that other students don't relate to Dumbledore the way that Harry does Harry just got daddy issues also well, true. and he's like the chosen one so like he relates to Dumbledore because none of the other kids ever get to talk to Dumbledore because they're not special right <laughs> I mean, think about how much of a loser you would be to be like, yeah, I have a really deep and abiding relationship with my principal. <laughs> Do you remember in School of Rock when Joan Cusack is like yelling at that kindergartner by accident? She like definitely doesn't realize that she's just like screaming at this little girl who's like, <laughs> would you like a hug? I'll be good, I swear. 
What if Dumbledore played by Joan Cusack? I think I figured it out. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> that works. Harry, do you want a hug? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so like I just agree with both Claire and Leaf Glore's emails. Like I hate Dumbledore. He's handling his headmaster privileges irresponsibly. He's putting students' lives at risk because you also have to take those things into account. Like the the I almost here I know we've said this on the show before, but I always want to call the series of Gauntlets and Sorcerer's Stone. I always want to call that the Chamber of Secrets. That's been like a thing that I've been messing up ever since I read these books in the first place. It's a chamber. But it's secret. It's full of secrets. It's an understandable if think, mistake. If you think about either one of those things, the Gauntlets or the Chamber of Secrets, it's like definitely the Gauntlets. Dumbledore's like, let's put a crazy murderous obstacle course in my school for children. And it's like, bro, you can't be getting paid twice. Like you are a headmaster. <laughs> but he told it's them like, that they shouldn't go there though. It's like working on your other job on company time. It's like, come on, man, just work. Could you it's, maybe just work this job, to, your, your job that we pay you for? I mean, by the same token though, like it's, Hogwarts is the kind of private school where, like, being the headmaster is more like being the president of a college, and, like, uh. with the answer to that question with the president of any college is, ha <laughs> no. It's a political appointment, essentially. Yes. Yeah. Which would that. actually make more sense in universe, but uh, we don't, we're not going to explore any of that. He's just a vague old man with vague, weird powers, and he seems to know everything. Here's my thing is like, I don't know how much he puts the students in danger and how much being a wizard is dangerous. And then also how much uh, having a dark lord figure as part of your wider community is dangerous. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, I guess that we don't have that cont cont to contend with. Yeah, I you guess know? we have to check our privilege there. Check our Dark Lord privilege. <laughs> if there were like, if there were like, you know, a couple thousand people in the U.S. and roughly a tenth of them were murderous assholes, you would be like, oh shit, we're already kind of fucked good. up with way lower percentages than that. So, you know, you think about it and mm. it's like, I think maybe being a wizard is so, just kind of dangerous. There's like densely chaotic evil energy in wizard. I, I tr like truly that is the undercurrent of this entire world. Like everything that we talk about when we discuss like why is this organized this way? Why does the school run like this? Like all of this is so inherently dangerous and I really think that's it. I think they're just they are leaning into the chaotic energy because what else are they going to do? Well, cuz also mm -hmm. magic is uh you know, even when controlled, quite dangerous. So it's like you're trying to teach 11 year olds to drive rocket ships at each other and, you know, at the world around them, basically. And you're having to trust them to have the maturity to not like fuck it up, but also to not play around with it in a way that goes poorly. This is why I yeah, say I the wizard children are like walking nuclear bombs. So I know I just think overall. I don't know how danger attracting Dumbledore is and how dangerous the wizarding world is in general. We talk sometimes, or we have spoken recently about how Madame Pomfrey must have been like a triage nurse yeah. in a, a war somewhere. Yeah. She, and, and then it's like, how is she so good at this craziness? It must be really wild <laughs> to be even a magician. <laughs> okay. Our next topic, our friend Ashley in the Discord, hey, Sash, asks, what is your favorite podcast memory so far? Thank you, Ashley. I was begging for conversation topics in the Discord, and Ashley's the only one who answered. Love you, babe. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite podcast memory. From, I, I from, guess I'll say that it has to be this podcast. <laughs> but, but, like, all... Like the whole show or the like just podcast. this book? Okay. All right. All f all five seasons. All right. Um, I mean, oh God, that's hard. I, I, this is just me fangirling for a moment, but the first time that we recorded with Adel Rafai was a wild experience because all of us were pretty big fans and, yeah. uh, uh, being he was like, our first guest ever too. He was our first real guest ever. And being 
uh, on a podcast. No, no, he, he, I want to clarify. He was our first guest ever. This was before we started inviting people's moms and husbands on the show. That's like he, he came before them. I hadn't practiced with fucking Jason yet. I mean, literally, so, you know, podcasting with Adol Refai from my kitchen, uh, very recently into doing a podcast, like we didn't have experience under our belt at no. all. We had no clue what we were he doing. Was so he was so nice. kind. <laughs> That was like a that was like a beautiful moment in like humanity for me. I'm like I'm like people are nice. Like people are a lot of times people are just nice if you are nice and and real with them. Well, I think that was like kind of the the first time that uh I saw us as part of like um the like wider podcasting community. That sounds really stupid probably no, to anyone true. who doesn't do a podcast, but like there is a lot of inter- interchange of ideas and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, I think also on another level, we say this all the time at Wildling, every new book we publish, we say, oh my God, it almost looks like a real book. <laughs> they all look very much like real books, but it's an imposter syndrome joke we make. Yeah. this It's like, oh my God, this is almost like a real podcast now. But, you know, a- aside from that, probably one of my favorite like comedic podcasting moments that's just us is listening to the first the last episode before covid lockdowns and hearing you guys uh make jokes about washing your hands not feeling sick so <coughs> 10 out of 10 <coughs> yeah listeners you can rest assured that all of us have washed our hands for at least 20 seconds before the start of this recording my house is now uh washed before entry and house. then um i immediately touched my face five gazillion times afterwards i hope someone listens to this podcast like <laughs> two years from now and they're like why are they so obsessed with washing, washing hands? hands yeah the 60 people left in america in three years <laughs> will be really confused about what this <laughs> one <laughs> that didn't age well Gets me one, every week time. Later, one week later that episode had not aged well <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny i loved it, really it so much wasn't that the one where Andrew sang? Oh, you may not think I'm pretty, <laughs> but don't judge on what you see. I'll eat myself if you can find a smarter hat than me. No, that's the following uh, one where it's just you, me, and Andrew, Haley. We're the only ones left on the ship. Yeah. So anyhow, that's that's like one of my favorite just us like comedic things. I wasn't necessarily there for that, but I find that that introduction <laughs> moment is very yeah. very funny. But it was quite funny. Also, Haley, what's your sorry? Oh? I have to add. Yeah, we, I guess we all get more. three. I have to add just one more. I'm so so sorry. <laughs> this is also an early days thing because we were all in the same room together. But Christina was so drunk and she went to pour oh, no. herself a glass of wine and just. <laughs> <laughs> didn't even kind of get the glass. She just dumped all nearly half a bottle of wine straight onto her kitchen table. On and- her white tablecloth. Uh, just uh, for our viewers at home to know, uh, <laughs> Tina was in such agreement with me uh, she that she spilled her wine. And so I, <laughs> and that just goes to show you the quality we were working with early on because we were just like, it's okay to be exactly this drunk and producing content. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I got uh, completely obliterated, I think, like two times on this show. And then I was like, that's enough, because both times the next day I was like, I don't remember ending the podcast. I really hope it was good. I have been thinking even recently, I'm like, do I get a little too fucked up on the show? <laughs> but uh, you tell me, listeners. <laughs> no, please don't. I'm going to carry on in this vein. <laughs> Haley, what's your favorite podcast memory so far? So I was really afraid that Brooke was about to say it because I think it might have been the same episode. Um, when you were super trashed. <laughs> so you guys haven't liked anything in it, No, this episodes. No, because, no, <laughs> just I'm gonna, up our act. We became less amusing to ourselves. I'm gonna remind you of this, and you're going to see why. Because it was the day that you were trying to end the episode, and I, like, I was kind of choking on my own spit, oh, and I was trying not to cough. So I was, like, holding it, but, like, you were staring at me, like, are you okay? And I was like, I'm trying... 
not to cry. And then, like, it just ends with you screaming at me, like, are you okay? And me, like, ducking <laughs> under the table so that I can try to cough and being like, just end the episode, Tina! End it! And what's my catchphrase? And what's my catchphrase? <laughs> my house. My house. <laughs> Kaylee? <laughs> Haley? Haley? Get get the fuck out of my house. Can you please just keep that whole I'm section so in? Sorry. Don't edit that out. Just, 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 hey, shush. Sh- 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 <sighs> get the fuck out of my house. <laughs> <laughs> and then it ends. <laughs> I- I'm so sorry, Christina. You thought this question was going to be us ruling any amount of this podcast that was like polished and good. This is a roast. I'm going to deflect from you guys talking about how drunk I was that one day. I'm going to tell you a story about our friend, our mutual friend, Rachel, being really drunk last weekend that I I am going to use to deflect from that drunk story. Okay, Okay. wait, hold on. Was it on the podcast? (laughs) No, this is not my favorite podcast memory. I'm just telling you a funny random story that happened to me within the last four days. Okay. <laughs> kind of seems like you were also going to pick an early memory and then now you feel like it's too much. No, I, I was actually not going to pick a favorite memory. No, I wasn't going to pick an early memory. I was going to pick a favorite memory, which is the My Immortal Thunderstorm episode. Absolutely nothing as compared. That was like the peak creative hilarious energy i'll ever have in my life yeah no it's i I think that is our best episode but i mean that one moment just stands out for me as a a jewel of our friendship and the podcast (laughs) wait let me tell this story about rachel okay okay it's funny rachel's bachelorette party was last week and we were camping at her aunt's house and she's singing guess what dancing queen by abba so loud with a karaoke microphone that's not hooked up to anything it's just for the vibe And she's in her little white mini dress and she's like singing Dancing Queen with her microphone. And I hand her a pipe full of weed for her to hit. And she takes it with her other hand. With her microphone hand, she holds the microphone out to Mia and she says, breathe in. (laughs) And Mia's like, no, sweetie, that's what you do with the other hand. (laughs) Wow, I, I just I'm I'm trying to count all of the ways that she fucked that up. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was quite fun. It was hilarious to me in a that's my friend kind of way. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I was like, it's, that's a, adorable and I can, hilarious. I can see it in my mind's eye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my po- favorite podcast memory was definitely my immortal triumph elephantly. I mean, come on. And, and, and like I. Would like to include also the My Immortal live show that we did for our patrons. That was that also one good. Time. That the, was very fun. The live show was very funny and very fun. Um, I riggedy wrecked my voice recording that entire episode. Really? Oh my god. Because I was screaming for a lot of it. Mm. <laughs> well, it's written in all capitals. What are you going to do? Yeah, yeah. truly. Um, my pod- favorite podcast memory so far. No, I'm just kidding. I was, I was gonna say when it ends, but that's not that's not in the spirit of things. Mm. Come on, Christina. I, okay. I, my favorite moment from the My Immortal episode would probably be uh, when we got past the Acid Bath Sisters and you, like, I got to see you start to see how much farther down the iceberg went. I told Haley I was in too deep, and she she literally was like, "Honestly, bitch, you have no idea what in too deep." <laughs> there is an like, iceberg. Here, okay. There's <laughs> A, egg on your face. This is a my immortal <laughs> iceberg here. Oh, we're diving deep, guys. There we go. <laughs> that was the part where I was having the most fun. Anyway. I've been playing Tears of the Kingdom so much that my brain is absolutely poisoned right now. And I'm just thinking about... <laughs> Like so, some places you're on the... The map is so like vertical that sometimes you like don't really... You're like, oh my god, I'm I'm on top of a mountain right now. That's what that reminds me of. You're like, I'm on a mountain of conspiracy theory, my immortal bullshit right now. Yes. I was was actually thinking about our friendship to not today, but yesterday, because I uh, dropped my daughter off at daycare and I was like, ah, this morning calls for evanescence. And I was remembering us (laughs) driving back from the Ren Fair in all of our Ren Fest outfits, listening to the My Immortal episode and then following it up with just like a round robin of people naming their favorite emo songs from our youth. 
And then that singing along my, to all of them. That was one of my mo- most favorite moments of my life. That same group of hoes <laughs> is going to a mansion in the middle of nowhere to go to the pool for a weekend in a couple of weeks, and I'm extremely excited. Yes. Oh, sorry, group of wenches. Hoes, wenches. I'm going to read next an email from Jay, they, them. Um, I probably abridged it, but I don't remember which of these I abridged. I should have notated them in some way, but people send me very long emails and I'm like, wow, this is great. If I read this out loud, that's going to be so many words for me. This is an audio book at this point. <laughs> um, Jay, they, them says, Christina here. Oh, and you, I mean, you guys know Jay. They've written it several times before. You know, Jay. Yeah. Christina, here's an observation about the structure of Order of the Phoenix that doesn't make sense to me. This is a, a, like a very nice highbrow, I think, like not highbrow, like high <laughs> concept, high con. I'm like, hmm, I didn't even notice that. Good looks, Jay. OK, the order isn't like the Order of the Phoenix isn't in a very good state when we first meet them. They're a bit unorganized, stuck in a rundown house's headquarters. Dumbledore obviously hasn't told them everything. Tonks is great, but a bit of a misfit and they aren't all on the same page. When Harry asks for more information about what they're up to, some are reluctant to tell him and others want to share. At the end of the book, however, they came in, they come in and kick the shit out of the Death Eaters. While that's great, why don't we see the Order train and work to improve themselves so that it makes sense when they then possess the ability to save the day? Kind of like Big Hero 6. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen that movie. I've seen it once a long time ago. Yeah, same. When we first meet that group, they're so bad as a team, they're literally getting into each other's way. We see them train and grow as characters and as a group, so at the end, they're able to overcome the challenge in front of them. What we do see is the growth of Dumbledore's army. They're all pretty untrained, and they don't believe in Harry as a leader. By the end, they're all improved and grown as a group, and Harry has grown as a leader. Until they get to the Ministry, they're essentially ineffective against the Death Eaters. It makes sense that a group of teenagers wouldn't be experienced enough to take on grown adults, but... It's odd to nullify all that character growth just to have the order come into the rescue. Is this supposed to be some parallel? Are we supposed to see the DA grow and improve and assume the order is doing the same thing? Then why is the book named after the Order of the Phoenix? This book makes makes my head and my heart hurt, Jay. They that oh my god, Jay. Your poor little heart. Haley, what do you make of this? So I do think that there's a deliberate parallel between Dumbledore's army and the order, and I think it's a really cool take. Uh, to discuss, like, what are they, uh, like, what's the order up to as a team throughout this book? Like, that's that's a great question. Besides, besides just scheduling shifts in the Department of uh, Yeah, straight up. Um, but I do also think that, like, all of these people have had combat experience in the past, not necessarily with each other, but, like, Kingsley and uh, Tonks are already Aurors. Like, Sirius Dude, was with I'm, the Order in the past. I, like, I feel like I want to see Tonks Auror ring because, like, I kind of have a hard time envisioning it. Maybe that's because fuck the police and I identify with her <laughs> on some level. And I'm like, come on, girl. I know that this isn't what you like. So I, I would like to see it. I don't think she's, like, super copy. I think yeah. I see her more as, like, a CIA type figure, like, gathering intel That's kind of what uh, the impression that I've gotten, because they do have a magical law enforcement squad that's mentioned a few times, and I think those are more like the cops, and I think the Aurors are like uh, like somewhere FBI. between detectives and the FBI. Yeah. So, like, they're they're on the case, but, like, they're, they're like a, a fucking Adam Driver in Black Klansmen. Like, that's the kind of shit they're doing. So... Hmm. Like it's okay. it's a little more it's a little less cop a little more secret agent, um, but like I'm like I don't find it surprising that the order members are able to function in a combat scenario better than like an administrative scenario. Those two things don't necessarily overlap. Uh, so like th- they are definitely disorganized as a group, largely because Dumbledore isn't telling them jack shit, um, but. In, in a whole ass fight, then yeah, I, I I trust them with that, and I think like the parallel with Dumbledore's army is that like, do the kids succeed against the Death Eaters? Not really, but they're able to hold their own for a hot minute, which like they wouldn't have been able to do if they hadn't already like been forming some cohesion as a team and practicing defensive spells. So like they got a few mm-hmm. good hits in. 
and they made it long enough that the adults were able to show up. I I see the parallel here as being more about, you know, what I see as some of the themes of this book of teenagers maturing. You know what I mean? Like, they aren't adults and they aren't going to be adults because they haven't had the practice. You know what I mean? But they have the confidence of teenagers to think that they could. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, it is one of those things where, like, it's it should act as a necessary uh, check to the ego and to the perceived self-importance and self-maturity of a bunch of teenagers thinking that they could do this. It makes sense to me that adults could do this. It does not make sense to me that teenagers could do this regardless of the montage that we see. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay. It's like my, you know, like young kids are shocked when parents pull off dinner because they don't know how to cook. And you might bring them into the kitchen and like show them how to chop onions and they can get real good at chopping onions and you tell them their mommy's special helper and they are the secret ingredient to the pasta sauce. But at the end of the day, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like <laughs> the kid's not actually making the pasta sauce and they will find that out when they move out to college and they're like, shit, mom, I don't know how to make pasta sauce. I can just chop the onions. And that's when you're like, absolutely, I'm glad that you're finally old enough to see that you're not actually doing this. Wow, it's like Freya doesn't even have to grow up because you've already predicted her entire life. (laughs) I remember when I first learned how to drive and I was driving on my own and I was like, how the fuck? This was before GPSs, (laughs) like, like, really. Mm -hmm. And I was like, how the fuck do mom and dad just know how to get around? Are you joking me? Honestly, I... I think about this uh, often, which is a weird thing to have pop into my mind often, I guess. But like one of my teachers one time was telling me that like while we were all kind of learning to drive, she she was like, well, because we were talking about how much like energy it takes, like how much mental energy it took to like operate a vehicle. And she was like, you will be surprised by the time you're in your like 20s, really you will do this in a way that is so robotic and automatic. You will have internalized it to an extent that you will get in your car and show up somewhere and be unable to recall the trip. Uh, but ain't that the truth? And it's that true. That never happened for me, but yeah. that's because my brain don't work no good. Right. But you know what I mean? Like it, it is, it is a thing that like, you know, uh, makes that sense. That does happen. You to know people. what I mean? You, you can get good enough at a thing that you don't even have to be doing it Often, like I don't, I don't ever have to practice driving. It's just a thing that I'm, I know how to do now. And I think that especially if your whole life is in a wizarding world and you do magic for a job, <laughs> magic would probably get to a point where you would be like, yeah, this is what I uh, do. Now you might be better at making soup than deflecting spells, but like I don't think it's a thing where it's like shocking, or that they they need like training. They're mm. I think Jay's email uh, depicts the order as kind of like a ragtag baseball team coming together on a dirt lot. And at the end, they're playing in the MLB. And I I don't know that that's a fair characterization. Also, because we see this whole story from teenagers' perspective, haughty teenagers' perspectives. Yeah. And so I think a lot of it is also Harry wanting them to be disorganized and messy and in need of him. Which they're not. (laughs) That makes sense. Uh, I do also... uh, Sorry, go ahead. No, you go right ahead. Okay. Uh, I do uh, also, though, I would like to see, like, what they were up to this whole time. Like, the... That's actually what I was... Yeah, like, I I, I do agree with uh, Brooke's assessment, but, like, I also agree with uh, (laughs) Jay that, like, that would be really interesting to me to... Like, see who these adults are when they're not being who they have to be around children, because, like, everyone has that. It's it's kind of like your customer service voice. Like, no. it's... Everyone's a little different around kids than they are you talk to normal. kids like they're real people, but just not like your 30-year-old best friend that you're drinking wine exactly. with. Exactly. <laughs> how, who, how do they talk to each other when it's just them so, and they're drinking wine? What I, what I want to know is... I think that at some point it says like Snape alerted like everyone who was at Grimald place and they all came running or something like that. And so like, what were these people literally doing tonight? Like, why were they, what were they all doing? Like hanging out, drinking in the kitchen? Like, what were they doing? See, I 
think in a good movie version of this, which I did not think we got a good movie version of this book. Mm-hmm. Um, I think in a good movie version of this, the parallel that Jay is drawing here of them, the kids practicing and getting better in the order, maybe not honing their skills with magic, but honing their skills as an organization would yeah. be... Yeah, or uh, like administratively. Yeah, I mean like administratively in like a good way. Them like getting good at like handing off information or like talking yeah. in code in ways that seem casual, you know what I mean? Like. Mm-hmm. Those kinds of things, I think, would be the split screen that you would get during the training montages, you know? Oh, that would be yeah. dope. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. I think even small things would be cool. Like, do you remember in the book when Arthur sees Kingsley at the ministry and he has to pretend like they're not best friends? Mm-hmm. And it's like a very funny little exchange. <laughs> like a little detail like that would be nice, I think. <laughs> Isn't Arthur telling him like, Molly's making meatballs tonight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then Come he's to like, dinner. Oh, fuck you, though, but get me that report. We're not friends. <laughs> He'll get me balls. I love Arthur Weasley so much. <laughs> okay, so th- this kind of ties back into that, at least talking about Dumbledore's army. I want to know, this is a question for me that I wrote, why do you think that Ginny, Neville, and Luna Lovegood are included in the finale of this book? I think Neville's there because he other prophecy boy. Other prophecy boy. I'll mm-hmm. allow it. I think Ginny is there for the same reason Luna is there, which is author like these girls. More girls, maybe. Have you thought about more girls? Well, take my two girls. And these are the only girls you get. All three. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, I, I literally think it's just that the, the author's a little bit in love with these characters and wants them to be there. I agree about Neville for sure, but Jenny and Luna, like, and I don't think there's any real reason for them to have even like volunteered. Like, I don't, I, I'm not following this. Jenny, I get because she's spunky. Luna, I think, is there because uh, she's seen death. I think they're uh, f- supposed to be foils to the main trio. Like, Whatever, though. like it's, <laughs> it's not like one hundred percent necessary. A climax but like, isn't a, isn't the time for a foil. They needed unless, backup unless the in the. Foils, they needed the backup point. in the fu- in the fight, so it might as well be their did. foils. I, I think they could have done this random assortment of spells like almost just as easily if it was just our trio. They've done a bunch of random good they need, shit and come the out. The more on top numbers before. you have, the harder it is to aim at you. When you said a climax is no place for a foil, I just imagined someone <laughs> orgasming really hard and grabbing a like a roll of tin foil and just like triumphantly arcing it over the bed. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Everyone's got their thing, three, man. Don't kink shame. But, three, but really, three foil characters in our climax it's a fo- sequence. It's a foil of, like of each. Chapters? It's a foil of each of them. Luna is obviously a foil to Hermione because she's all whimsical need, and shit. Why do you need foils? Who needs foils? Because my dude? they're like, getting you don't need older. To- they're I getting think- older. It's exploring their characters more by introducing more characters for them to play off of because they've only been hanging out with each other for four years. I do I agree generally that Haley is right and that I think uh, they are uh, I don't know about total foil but maybe they are meant to show the difference in the maturity and willingness to embrace danger but also handle dangerous situations that our trio has gained over being in many of them versus real kids I don't know. The real kids kind of just still run directly into it. I know, but like real kids would run directly and you know what I mean? Like I I don't think I would have I was a crazy fifteen year old and I don't think I would have agreed to this. I think I would have found a reason to stay behind. But like they've got a this is like an idealistic thing for the other three, and I think that uh the point is the moment when Harry, Ron, and Hermione like Ron and Hermione don't really have anything to do with Sirius either. They do not have to be politically involved with all this bullshit, but he's just assuming they're coming with, and, like, why wouldn't they? And also, they're the ones with experience, as you've said, with these kinds of adventures. But then Neville and Ginny and Luna want to come along, and all of a sudden he's like, you can't come along, you're kids! And they're like, fuck you, so are you. So it's kind of the fact that they're more normal than the other three and more regular than the other three 
kind of highlights like, hey, this is super dangerous for all of you, actually. And also gives them more targets during the fight so that, you know, it's easier to run and scatter. Well, and I also think that it gives, uh, wow, this sounds bad. Harry's kind of a shitty friend. We know this. I I think he is used to the idea of putting Ron and Hermione in danger and doesn't think twice about it. But having these other characters is what gives him his moment of like uh, conscience. And it's because he doesn't Mm. trust their capabilities because he does see them as normal kids. And so he's like, if it was just me, Ron and Hermione, I would feel okay about this because a, I know that they have chosen these situations before and that they would choose them a thousand times again. B, I'm confident mm-hmm. in their abilities because I've seen them in similarly dangerous situations. And then C, we are best friends and I feel that like this is what best friends do, even though Harry's the only one with nothing to lose and he forgets that constantly. And while well, rather that Sirius is his one thing to lose and that's why he's here. And so, you know, I think that the, the only reason that they survive this maybe is because Harry had a reason for once to play it safe. So this question in particular, to me, I can't not look at it from an editor's perspective. And I think that this is too many fucking characters to be visually keeping track of. And I I mean that when you're reading a book like this, there's fucking like 15 goddamn characters and you are having to keep track of like where they are because they keep moving in a new place. It's like a fucking nightmare for like processing like you can't get a. I don't feel like you can get a good grip on anything. And editorially, I would have told her that she needed to clarify it. Like you need to like send some characters ahead to like make it like you need to like you need to do something like maybe some people do fucking stay behind at Hogwarts. Like there just can't be like 15 individual people like moving chess pieces in your climax. Like, I think it's a nightmare to follow. I think it's supposed I mean, so to be a nightmare to follow. Yeah, and so I is a war zone. It. I actually support it for what, for the, the inherent chaos, chaos of the scene. I think it illustrates that without having to like constantly say like, it was pandemonium. You know yeah, what I it's, mean? Like, it, it's like, uh, it's like the dark, it's like the dark gritty take on those Scooby-Doo montages where everyone's running in and out of doors, but like the wrong doors across a hallway. It's, I think that literally does happen in the room. It does. Door. It does literally happen like a couple of times. <laughs> Everyone's kind of popping in and out and like scattering and then finding another door and running through that door and then more people show up and there's all of this shit going on and spells flying everywhere and where is everybody and what's going on and that's, I haven't been in a war zone, but you know, that doesn't not sound like a war zone. I guess to me, it's just that there's like not like a why. Like, why does it have to be like this? Like, I just I w- I think I was because so- wizards are all about I the think- drama, Tina. I- it's been actually a really long time since you've dropped that one on. Us, it, yeah, right? well, you gave me it, it was wide <laughs> open. I mean, I I just like the whole last like two hundred pages of this book. I'm like, why, why, stop, stop, stop. Like, no, like none of this. It's because uh, because we need something really really <laughs> exciting and and chaotic and overwhelming to force us to sit down and endure the whole chapter where Dumbledore explains himself. Mm, I hate those chapters. I hate Don't let Dumbledore him explain himself. himself. Yeah, 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 exactly. Mm-hmm. And that's I think that that is why the cha- uh, like the more uh, the more drawn out the Dumbledore explaining himself chapter is the more uh, dramatic the climax has to be to tucker you out so that that can be the thing that drones you off to sleep. (laughs) Let's move on. Next, I want to read an email from Takena. And this is, as they say, stream of consciousness. (laughs) So I'm going to read it in bits and we can uh, we can bullshit about what she said a little bit. Um, from Takena, hey Tina and the rest of the restricted section crew. Uh, first of all, do not feel obligated to read my crazy email aloud to anyone ever, but you do have permission to, and then that's what matters. <laughs> Spoilers! <laughs> we out here. Fuck standardized testing. I grew up in a state that had test set grades three and five. I think Virginia did too. Oh, Takena, did you grow up in Virginia? Just wondering. During the first year, I had my first panic attack since the teacher I had was yelling at me for not writing fast enough during a practice test. 
Anyway, also owls reminds me of AP testing. Also, fuck them for having them stay up all night and then take another test in the morning. How can they take the score seriously? Um, like when we had AP testing or final exams, we didn't have homework and they were like, go to sleep early, eat a good breakfast. So I think specifically to kind of talking about how they had like the astronomy exam and then like at midnight and then they still had like a 9am exam the next day, Uh, which is crazy. Yeah, that is, that is some nonsense. I think we also, um, had standardized testing, right? So who, wait, Uh, the SOL. Did you grow up in North Carolina, Brooke? Yes. Did you have... Standardized testing? What was it called? Uh, I went to school in North Carolina, but I went to private school, so our processes were a little bit different. You didn't. You didn't have to take the standardized test. The only one I can remember taking is like the pre SAT, the PSAT. Hmm. Mm. Interesting. I remember uh, taking SOLs like. Yes, I took like a lot every of yeah, a lot of fucking SOLs, like um, a lot of SOLs, and there was that girl in my high school named Christina Canu, K A N U, and anytime I talked to her, she would be like, "See you at SOLs." <laughs> um, I so SOLs are part of the were I think instituted as part of the No Child Left Behind Act, and they're tied mm. to public school funding. So I mm. think if you don't need the funding, you don't have to. Yeah, we wow. definitely didn't have to do SOLs when I started going to private school, which what? was one of the, yeah, it was like one of the best things about it. I should have gone to private school. No, I was a pretty good test taker. I was lucky. <laughs> I but was not. I even even though I was a good test taker, I still think that they're inherently bullshit. Like so many people in my life have struggled so much with tests. Like even my extremely smart youngest brother Ryan who is literally one of the smartest people I've ever known, but he was super bad at tests because he writes left-handed and it's like slower and harder to write left-handed. Look, every single study that has ever looked into current testing methodology has proven that it's bullshit and it doesn't predict anything. Like, I mean, like thoroughly doesn't Mm -hmm. predict anything. Doesn't prove Mm -hmm. shit. Um, Including even like performance at additional academics. Like your, your performance in college isn't tied to your SATs at all. And the only reason they exist at this point is because they've lobbied universities. They exist for the same reason TurboTax exists. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason that I ended up going to private school like halfway through high school was because all of my friends were just like too maladjusted to be in public school anymore. Uh, And gradually it was just like all of them had left. Uh, And I spent like all of sophomore year in high school just relentlessly researching and presenting to my parents all of the bullshit things about the public school system to convince them like this this is why this it's a bad place it's bad please get me out and like it is a bad place yeah for a lot of people. so like i it was the shit like having to wake up that early in the morning and like standardized testing i did a bunch of fucking research at the age of like 14 to try and talk my family into just, like, getting me out of my public school because it sucked so bad and standardized testing was part of that. Yeah. Yep, okay, cool. Mm-hmm. So, fuck tests. Yep. To Kenna's next bullet point, I think McGonagall was so surprised by their attack. The attack on her person when she went... They were attacking Hagrid. She went to go defend him that attack. I think McGonagall was so surprised by their attack because she was just telling them off and they turned and attacked without hesitation, which showing their intent was to go and subdue Hagrid with magic. (laughs) Dash idiots. Okay. I agree to kind of dash idiots. It is silly that they went and tried to go take him down with magic. Like they don't know that he's like kind of impervious to like not very good magic. Yeah. Like I think they send, I think they thought like, eh, we'll just send a bunch of guys. Surely a bunch of guys can a pull it off. A bunch of guys will be enough. Yeah. Oh my god, have you seen, have either of you seen RRR? Mm-hmm. No. Remember when he goes through mm-hmm. a, so bunch guys. Guys. <laughs> a bunch of guys. many guys. A bunch of guys. There's actually, they go through so many guys in that movie, honestly. Is this, <laughs> like it, so many scenes. Is this like a John Wick thing or a porno? It's, no, it's neither. It's like dancing it's and friendship. It's Bollywood. <laughs> oh. Okay. I was way off. And I do like that point that, like, McGonagall was probably going to, like, tell them off and then 
it was was surprised when they reacted with magic. You know, she's just kind of like better than that. I, I mean, well, also she's a disciplinarian, but she does work at a school. Like at no point is she walking into a classroom of rowdy students expecting to be attacked by multiple people with magic. You know what I mean? Like that's not right, part of yeah. her day to day. And she's like, I'm on school grounds. Who's going to try to like physically assault me with magic in front of a bunch of kids? You know what yeah, I mean? But yeah, but they but they fucking do. Yeah, there, there's they also like a bad. there's also like a social contract thing in there. You know, it's like anytime like someone busts out indiscriminate violence in any yeah. such like without provocation, it's always like, what the fuck are you doing? And mm-hmm. so like so she was already mad about like you're you're breaking the social contract by like coming out in the open and going after Hagrid forcibly like this there are so many steps that there should have been just from the rule of law in so far as there is one for wizards right and like you you just jumped right over all of them and how dare you and like she hasn't caught up with how far they are past the social contract so like she didn't realize Uh we were already at like just shoot like point blank range like oh is that where we are okay great they don't shoot her at point blank range, but they shoot her from a distance. I wonder how far me and my tears of the kingdom brain. I wonder how far their shots go. <laughs> I mean, it's never really specified how big the Hogwarts grounds are. So, I mean, who the fuck knows? But also how much range does magic have? Yeah, I think it probably depends on the person. Surely, like if you shoot a spell into space. Does it fizzle out at some point? Is it like a bullet? Does, Does it, it rebound? Going? Does it like lose velocity and curve Can back down? Can a spell exist in a vacuum? <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Question hmm. for the philosophers. Let us know. Write is- in and let us know. <laughs> yeah. Well, like my thing is more like, is it like is it like with a gun where there's like a kind of automatic mechanism involved that can potentially be like pulled on impulse or like is it impossible to do magic like that impulsively like did someone very much on purpose like think through like and fuck this old lady i mean i I think it's i mean we've we know from other instances in the series that magic is heavily based on your emotional state you know even things like you know he she tries to go after bellatrix and she's like bitch you can't just say crucio you know what I mean? Like you gotta feel the Crucio, <laughs> and you know what I mean. So it's I I we know that. So I'm trying to make Crucio happen, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Like we have to. You, you there yeah. is an emotional connection to magic. I think that if you're jumpy, that instinct to protect yourself could probably produce that magic without you really having to consciously do much about it. Mm. Sure would be nice if we knew how magic worked. Anyway. No, that's too hard. To Kenna's next point, she says, now, red velvet cake. I kind of love this email because I feel like it's giving me the highlights of season five that I don't remember. But I guess we were talking about red velvet cake at some point. Honestly, I'm mad that I missed that discussion because it is my favorite cake. Well, get ready for it. Wait, was I the reason? I have no idea. I went through a real phase of eating a lot of red velvet cake (laughs) around Valentine's Day. Well, so you probably weren't the one who brought it up because apparently when we were talking about it, we had no clue what red velvet cake was because it kind of felt the need to explain it to us. So I'll read to this email. Red velvet cake. It is a type of chocolate cake that through the science of baking is velvety in texture due to vinegar in the batter. People often don't do this now. So not only are they just making red chocolate cake, it's not even a velvet cake. So the red color originally comes from the vinegar reacting to the old style non-Dutch anthocyanin rich coca cocoa fuck i was so proud about pronouncing it correctly that i pronounced cocoa wrong no no no! it's a cocaine (laughs) cake keep going also many traditional recipes include beetroot wait just wait for it okay (laughs) the cocoa is no longer used and is processed differently so the reaction no longer happens so instead people just color it with food coloring or beet juice 
I am of the opinion that people should just let the cake be brown and let the texture stand on its own. And as I said, most people don't even like, don't even make a velvet style cake anymore. I feel educated because I actually did not understand red velvet cakes before this moment. That really is fascinating. I knew all of that, but I still love hearing it out loud. The the <laughs> um, red velvet cake is one of my favorite cakes. So to Ken, I appreciate your passion for red velvet cake. Although I, I do have, have a question for, I guess, Takena. <laughs> Takena, tell us. You um, can tag Brooke in the in the Discord, or maybe. Yeah, show no, up. yeah. If you tag me directly, I do show up. <laughs> Traditional red velvet cake can be made with either a baked, a stovetop baked white frosting, so a cooked white frosting, or a cream cheese frosting. Cream cheese has become more popular in recent years because most people don't have the patience to do a cooked white frosting, but cooked white frosting is technically the original. So I would love to hear her thoughts on cream cheese v. cooked white frosting. Oh red cake. What the hell is cooked white frosting? I have this so much is, reading to do. This is the B plot of the podcast. Is red <laughs> belt, figuring out red velvet cake. This is our arc as we get older. It's just like <laughs> exchanging baking tips. You know that Grace plugs a recipe almost every time she's on the show. Yeah. <laughs> She plugs a recipe every time I see her. Takena says, Order of the Phoenix used to be my favorite book because I related to the angst and would just like rush through the book. Reading it slowly is so excruciating. It's so boring and poorly written. And got to be honest, I am not even reading it. Good. I don't recommend anyone Teachers read Teacher's pets. <laughs> but like no editing. And someone said it was like a chapter between chapters. And that is like the whole book. I can't emphasize this enough. I don't think anyone should be reading along at this point. (laughs) Like, guests come on and they're like, sorry, I only read this chapter. And I'm like, God, don't read more. Like, you don't have to drop everything and pick up Harry Potter right now. Yeah, that makes perfect sense, actually. Stop getting lawful guests. (laughs) Okay, to Kenna's next bullet point. I'm I'm loving these bullet points to Kenna. Thank you so much. So I hate enjoy. Perhaps there is an implied slash there. How the character the author is most like is Umbridge. Like just constant prejudice and a refusal to listen to any point of belief for a second uh, about how they're wrong. Like they inadvertently gave us a character that says exactly how we feel about them now that their opinions are open to the public. I've heard other people say this before. that like J.K. Rowling is like an Umbridge character. And it's funny because... She obviously wrote her as, like, the most evil villain in this series, I feel like. Mm. And it's like, oh, no, it's like the most, it's like a very perfect parallel. It, yeah, it's, I remember, um, it might have been Pottermore. It might have been, like, the website that she had before Pottermore that was just, like, little flash puzzles. But, like, kind of a sit, like, you could unlock uh, pages of notes uh, mm-hmm. It was one of those mm-hmm. two, anyway. But yeah. I remember finding uh, her notes about uh, Umbridge and how, like, she's incredibly like frilly, and how like all of the worst, bigoted, like, awful people I've ever met for some reason were just like very cutesy, like weirdly cutesy, uh, like like little p- decorative plates with kitties on them and like teapot collections cutesy but then like they would be a huge like like a raging racist so like yeah yeah for a long time after these books came out like to the cons- like the christian right here in the states like she was kind of public enemy number 1 like a lot of kids weren't allowed to read harry potter because it's witchcraft liberal witchcraft the worst Mm. kind and like i don't know if it's accurate to say that her opinions were revealed to the public like there's an element of that because she was definitely flirting with these attitudes for a while but like it's a really sad transformation it's a cautionary tale about not becoming an asshole because she used to be a pretty normal imperfect but well-meaning white feminist kind of liberal who got confronted with one concept that was just a little a little too much for her a little too jazzy yeah just a little too jazzy and (laughs) could not cope and just spiraled it's like 
It's like something about Umbridge and JK Rowling. It's like denying it's like denying things that are directly in your face, just objectively not threatening you, but like they are directly in your face. And it's like, no, no, not that. And it's like, but it like the, But it's happening. Like it, what? Yeah, and, and like also there's there's just there's just not a there's either it, there's kind of a weird uh, opposite there actually because with Umbridge it's like there's a there's no huge problem. What are you talking about? Everything is mm. fine. And with Rolling, it's there's a huge problem. Everything is like, terrible, no and the world is falling apart. It's like it's wow. some people are doing a thing that you don't get yeah. for their own reasons that you don't get. That's yeah. that's most of life, babe. Just let it go. Yeah. It's fine. Let it go. Let it go. It's truly um, fine. To kind of to wrap up her email, she goes on to talk about the centaurs a little bit, which I I honestly don't feel like I want to revisit. Um, and then <laughs> wraps, it up, <laughs> wraps it up by talking about how the way the other species are treated in general in the sh- series shows how the author views people different to themselves. I think to kind of talking specifically about like the humanoid species. The oppressed creatures that are only superficially helped are just highlighting how much the author does not care about others. Like she loves to other people and then keep them down and raise up the natural wizards. Like there's no furthering of centaurs, goblins, house elves, all beings that are clearly sentient and deserve to be more a part of the magical community. Mm, white feminist energy. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's it right there. Mm-hmm. But like without the feminism, because she hates women. And I think that that, that ties back to Umbridge's hyperfeminism, like the way <laughs> maybe, hyperfemininity. Maybe, maybe it's because I just also take the pink thing personally, but I have I've never liked like J.K. Rowling's like, what if you were this girly? That would, like you, we hate that, right? Like we hate girls. <laughs> it's just like I don't know, man. It's like uh, why can't she just be a bitch? Like why does she also have to be these other things? I think that. This author is just super lazy. And like to kind of mention, just as like, look at this. Doesn't that suck? And then doesn't do any work whatsoever yeah. <laughs> to prove anything. Yeah, that's about right. <laughs> like she invents. J.K. Rowling invents new species for humanity to subjugate. <laughs> like that's like that's what's happening in this book. Like these are not real species. In science fiction and fantasy, you can do anything you want to. And if you're smart, you can make it good. (laughs) And if you aren't really that good at writing, maybe, then it's nonsense fantasy land. It kind of takes on a a note of Willy Wonka and the Oompa Loompas. Yeah. That's something that I've learned since working in publishing is that people who don't read fantasy are like, this book doesn't make any sense. That's fantasy, right? And it's like, no. (laughs) That's not what that is. That's sci-fi. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> eh, she's not wrong. The next email is from Claire. I do realize we already read an email from Claire, but she sends good emails. Claire says, hi, all. Hope you're doing well. I am re-listening through the backlog of episodes, and I just got to the Pen Sieve episode in which, uh, in Goblet, in which both Adel and Christina question the legitimacy and the mechanics of Pen Sieve memories. Why are we, as the audience, supposed to trust Pensieve memories from any of the characters? We know that from Slughorn in Book 6 that the Pensieve memories can be altered by what the person wants to believe or how they want to remember the story. Yet, we immediately trust Snape's memory from Chapter 28 to be absolute truth, despite Snape being traumatized as a child hating sociopath during the rest of the series. If you think back to your bullies from middle and high school, you probably will hyperbolize and exaggerate how bad it might have been. Why do we treat Snape's memories any different? I'm not trying to absolve the Marauders of the bullying that probably happened, but every recount of the Marauders era Hogwarts is unreliable. Whether by Snape's trauma from not having any friends besides potentially Lily, Sirius's trauma from his time at Azkaban, losing his mind, or glorifying uh, James and his time at Hogwarts, or Remus's trauma after losing so many friends and being isolated in the war. Would love to hear your thoughts. I love this perspective. And honestly, every episode that comes out where we talk shit about any of the Marauders, Claire DMs me and is like, ouch, I'm loving this episode, but it hurts. <laughs> I, I think that, I mean, we do see in Slughorn's altered memory that it like feels altered while we're in it. 
is the only uh, kind of yeah. justification that I'll throw in. But, I, but that that's the only example we have, though. And, like, maybe Slughorn is just bad at it. It's so possible. I think it comes I think it comes down to like the actual mechanics of the Pensieve, which like is never confirmed one way or the other, but if the entire point of the Pensieve is that it's like it's like your brain's core data of that moment, like without without perceptive editing, it's like taking a step outside of your own perspective to mm-hmm. watch from like a third party and so i think it's i get the impression that it's supposed to work in that way where like you can revisit a memory and see like how accurate is how i'm remembering this how would you confirm that a pensive actually functions i don't know but the slughorn thing is a good point wouldn't that depend on when you take the memory out of your brain? No, it's because, it's like, like it's the it's the original file. Yeah, I, it's the I unedited think, file. It's like I, the it's it's the first it's the file that you keep mm. from before the first edit. If mm. if there is any reason why I would definitely think that this wasn't an edited memory, something that we could trust, it's because he tries to hide it. People don't bother hiding lies. Lies think, hide the truth. I think Slughorn might have been implied to have, like, magically tried to alter his memory mm. to, like, fu- to like f- alleviate the guilt. This is complex because, like, I feel like when you're experiencing a memory, it's, like, through your brain. I feel like there's no original file that is unaltered. You know what I mean? And I think that's kind of what Claire was getting at. Like, maybe, like, Snape saw all these things through a certain lens or like they felt a certain way because of his like existing trauma. I think it And so does like that colors that. stuff like as you're perceiving it. You know what I mean? I think like there are people who have like neurological disorders in like the memory part of their brain where they remember everything literally. Like, they remember every literal detail. Like, your brain does take in all of that. It's just that you're not, like, conscious of it. Your it's like storage in a museum. It. Yeah. So, like, it, it is my like understanding. We need a brain scientist on yeah, this Yeah, episode. I mean, I, I would be willing to, like, take a back seat there, obviously, because, like, I'm, I'm working from vague memories of things that I have read. Uh, but And we all know how reliable memory can be. Right. But... I do credit myself as having a pretty good memory for a lot of stuff, uh, including random trivia facts. So, do you remember? Do you remember Haley that when my dad was like, "Oh, in twenty, in you know, like twenty twenty, my dad was like, "Oh, I listened to a couple episodes of your podcast," and I was like, "Oh my god, that's great! Did you like them?" And he was like, "Yeah, I liked that one girl, the the smart one," and I was like. <laughs> me and he was like no nope. <laughs> and i was like Haley, and he was like that's the one, no, the smart one. Yeah. i do remember you telling me that <laughs> your dad's hilarious and has excellent taste smart girl and also mean i do like this though claire like i like i like wondering about the li- like for example we see a lot of dumbledore's memories throughout this series and like who's to say that he hasn't fudged anything like he's not reliable in terms of, like, his honesty and transparency, and he's also extremely magical. He's not, and I don't think Snape is either, but the reliability of the exact details, I think, is less important than the overall context and the fact that it probably was similar, even if not exact. Like, the degree to which their shitty may have differed, but the fact that they were shitty is probably the kernel of truth, regardless. Hmm. I guess I'm wondering more if Dumbledore, like, intentionally changed things. You know what I mean? Oh, like, you mean, most like, in of, Dumbledore's memory? Moving away like, from the Yeah, Dumbledore's. Thing? But also, ev- I'm trying to think of every memory of his that we visit, and they're nice. all about other people and not about, like, stuff that he did. Um, just... Yeah, there... You're right. There's the one where he goes to get Tom Riddle from the orphanage mm-hmm. yeah and then There's i the guess trial. you're actually right that those are yeah like oh, no, most of, the well, trial well, all of, in, yeah but all of the fire but why would he change yeah, well, yeah all like of the, there's no point well like all of those trials aren't memories about himself yeah they're things that he remembers seeing but they aren't things oh. that like he would want like but that why doesn't would matter. he, he could to still, change them 
Well, yeah. People generally he change memory. <laughs> like, he could, <laughs> theoretically, but, like, it just never comes up. All right. I would like to read our final email of the night. This one's from Mots. Mots, you sent other emails that were too long, and I didn't read them because the episode has to end at some point. Mots says, hey... <laughs> you asked for listeners input regarding the whole thing about turning things invisible being or not being a part of transfiguration so here's my theory <laughs> Joanne didn't know or care enough to think this shit through thank you all for the show I love you all sincerely Mots Mots wow. I love you too that was very <laughs> concise and perfect <laughs> spot on my dude let me just check the old Discord server and see if anyone uh, has any final questions for us. Oh, tie dye guy. 10 p.m. with a question for us. Our final question. Do you think this is your last reading of the Harry Potter series? Brooke, what do you think? Uh, I don't know. If my daughter's interested in it one day, I would probably reread it with her. But probably but not like in less inspired to. No. You've already read it twice, which is more than most. Yes. Mm. Haley, what about you? Are you going to read it again someday? Mm. I have no immediate plans. I could see myself doing it, like, when I'm elderly and bored. <laughs> Haley, that was almost going to be verbatim my answer. <laughs> like, I, I, I definitely am going to need, like, probably a decade, but then maybe I'll read it all in a week and it'll feel like the good old days. Mm. You know what I mean? I'll be like, yikes, 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 but it'll be, we'll be going th so fast that I won't even be able to feel it's like, yikes. <laughs> yeah, because you won't have to go through, a, like, fucking chapter by chapter and do a liter, like, a book report, like, but a funny drunk <laughs> one on a every funny, single a chapter. A funny report. drunk book report. <laughs> Haley, my next podcast is kind of also a funny drunk book report. Yes, Why I know. It? <laughs> it's your is brand. Wait, I'm going to buy funny drunk book report right now. <laughs> Um, Brooke, do you have any last words about Order of the Phoenix, period, before we move on with our lives? Um, no. Liked it more than I expected. I think viewing it through a comedic, dramatic teenage lens, uh, severely helps it. So, also read it quick. Yeah, Brooke, slow rolling this book is the wrong choice. <laughs> I think that if you liked the comedic, teenage, dramatic part of it, I think you're gonna fucking love Half-Blood Prince, I've because I think it's only that, and so much conciser and better and funnier and cuter. I believe you. In, in my opinion. Haley, do you have any final words about Order of the Phoenix? Period! No. No, I think we're good. I think I think having the uh, the trauma dump episode followed by the group therapy episode, I've gotten it all out. <laughs> yeah, you, you, are you sure after all of these episodes you don't have anything left to say? I, I think I'm good. I think I'm actually Honestly, good. Yeah. Honestly, Honestly, I'm good, too. Like, I'm done. Let's go to Haplet Prince. I like that book so much more. I read it, like, three months ago to pre-read, to take my notes, and I love that book. So do me a favor, listeners. Please send me messages for, guess what, our Half-Blood Prince pregame episode, which is coming out July 12th. Between now and then, we'll have some unlocked Patreon bonus episodes, perhaps a little Alien or Wizard. Ooh, that was a weird one that we did not anticipate, but came out good, though. I changed the name of it halfway through. <laughs> um, also, our Fantastic Beasts episode from the Patreon. Um, and then finally, the legendary Mott's Hardest Harry Potter Trivia Ever episode. Oh, God. <laughs> that... Episode is actually, I think, one of my favorite moments on no, the that, podcast. I've never felt less in control of my own podcast. That was... <laughs> including when I blacked out in episode three. Kind of legendary. <laughs> I mean, that and when you blacked out in episode three. Um. And then, of course, we're also going to be releasing one single Pride Month episode. I don't like to give too much pride to this fandom, but I'll give it its due in a 30-minute episode. <laughs> Out of spite! <laughs> Out of spite. Um... And then we're going to get into Half-Blood Prince, which I genuinely do like. So I, I like I'm excited to maybe get back into a book I like. Like I want I want my persona on this podcast to be enjoying herself. <laughs> <laughs> like Order of the Phoenix was so rough for me. Um, well, and then and then we move after ha uh, Half-Blood Prince to the end. It's fine. It's fine. One. one one book at a time, one chapter at a time, one funny drunk book report step at a time. Step by step, day by day. The last episode ever of this podcast is coming out on Christmas 2024. 
That's wild. I scheduled it already. Thank God. So anyway, listeners, please send your Half-Blood Prince questions. Are y'all ready to move on to plugs? Mm -hmm. Are we doing plugs? I, it's yeah, we always do plugs. Oh, I thought, I thought that was just chapter episodes. (laughs) No, I do. All right, I have, I have nothing prepared, but okay. Haley, why don't you go first? All right, cool. Uh, Dracula Daily is happening again. Oh, yeah, boy. yeah, Hell yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you want to get regular letters from your good friend Jonathan, who's having a lovely vacation in Transylvania? Uh, then, boy, howdy, <laughs> do I have the uh, chronological epistolary romantic novel for you? Um, whatever you think you know about Dracula, if you haven't read the book, then no, you don't. Uh, it's one of the most adapted uh, to film books of all time, and. Not a single one of those movies is even a little bit similar to the, like book. the book. There's the there's a Keanu one, and then now there's also a Nicolas Cage one. The Nicolas Cage and one is actually like has the fun. most references to the actual. It's pretty like, worthwhile. It's honestly it, like it, it, I had a good time. Yeah, it's a great time. It makes me wish we still did movie night crew. It acknowledges the fact that Renfield existed, so there's that. That's there is. There's that. a whole He's dude named Renfield. He eats bugs. Renfield's up. Uh, spoilers, not really. But Renfield had an apartment in that movie, and I want his apartment. It's it, so it, cute. He's genuinely great at decorating. Uh, but yeah, Dracula yeah. Daily. Uh, it's just it's all of Dracula in chronological order, straight to. The email inbox of your choice. I recommend your work email so you have something to look forward to during the day. Um, but uh, <laughs> you're like, this is literary. I get it. Yeah, yeah. It's you know, you do what you got to do. Uh, but <laughs> if you haven't read Dracula and you've been meaning to, we're not that far in. It keeps going until well into October. Hell yeah! Wonderful plug, Haley. You pulled through. Hey, Brooke. Where can people find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Passion for Parks, and I would like to plug uh, Last Train to Key West. It is a amazing summer read. It's a unique historic fiction romance novel, and that it deals with an event that I didn't know existed prior to the fact that <laughs> there was a book that I read about it. So, um, uh, very interesting. Uh, very fun, you know, uh, female driven, but like weird combination of like gangsters and, you know, all kinds of, of good stuff, but good summer read, like a good beach read. Um, cool. So yeah, last train to Key West. Highly recommend. Amazing. Thank you so much. I've been your host, Christina. You know where to find me. And today I'm going to plug. Who fucking knows? Not me. I'll plug the book I'm reading because I'm enjoying it, but I'm only halfway through. But I am reading Light from Uncommon Stars by Rika Aoki, which is a a really bananas mashup of like four books into one. And I'm having a great time, but you have to be okay with whiplash a little bit. Um, It's like, what if Deal with the Devil? Also, Violent Prodigy. Also, Transgender Narrative. Also fucking aliens also family legacy okay wow, yeah read a, the book it's, a lot. It's, it's wild it's a, it's a lot but like i'm having a great time <laughs> anyway fuck order of the phoenix that's how i feel personally brooke i'm glad you had a good time <laughs> Haley. it's cool that you had medium thank you both so much for doing this episode <laughs> with, with me i love you so much we love oh. you too love you Sorry if we're getting some ambient maple noise here at the last moment. <laughs> she ran in and decided she wanted to participate. Maple, stop walking through the paper. <laughs> <laughs> paper, my cats, if there's paper on the floor, they wait until I'm almost done with my podcast to be like, yo, what about this paper, though? Mm-hmm. <laughs> mom, mom, was... mom, 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 check this out, check this out, check this out. That's it, potheads. Thanks for listening to the restricted section. This podcast is produced and hosted by me, Christina Kahn. Our theme music was produced by Ryan Kahn. Our logo was designed by Michael Hardison. Please connect with us on Twitter at RestrictedPod, on Instagram at RestrictedSectionPod, on Facebook at RestrictedSectionPod, or in our Facebook group, The Restricted Section Detention Crew. Join our Patreon to get access to our Discord server, our bonus episodes, and other cool perks. We're also very happy to be a member of Deus Ex Media, where all you fucking nerds can find all kinds of fandom podcasts to suit your fancy. Hey, 
Have you ever gotten so distracted in Stardew Valley that you forgot to sleep? Have you realised that you have a whole room in your house full of dolls? Or have you even bored your friends to sleep talking about your passion? Well then, Content Capable is the podcast for you. Join me, Sam, as I chat to people passionate about what they do, asking questions about how they fell in love with their passion, what they do, and how it interacts with their day-to-day lives. Catch the podcast every Monday as I find out what makes someone tick, all while gleaning interesting and insightful life lessons along the way. There'll be laughs, a bit of crying, a whole lot of conversations, and we learn just a little bit more about the world around us. Sorry, I'm just laughing because I'm planning to take a video of myself dragging this notes file into my (laughs) archive folder later, and I'm giggling about how funny that's going to be because that's the kind of bitch I am. (laughs) Sick organization burn. (laughs) You know me. Yes, I do. (laughs) You know me. Dave X Media.